Uh, the Budget Committee is a place where some of the most important questions facing our nation are asked and hopefully where we can come together in a responsible way to answer them. Many of those questions will be about how to t we can tackle our debt and deficit challenges responsibly. And while this is important, it's not all this committee is about. A budget is a reflection of our values and priorities. It is a vision for what we believe creates economic success and broad-based national prosperity. It outlines our short and our long-term economic policies. It is where we make decisions about what kind of nation we want to be now and where we lay down the foundation for accomplishing even more in the years ahead. This last point is what we will be discussing in today's hearing, the role and impact of federal investment on people, communities, and long-term economic growth. And it is going to be a critical part of the pro-growth, pro-middle-class budget resolution we are working to write. Because there's no question getting our debt and deficit under control is a challenge we have to confront but we have many other challenges we can't ignore. We need to repair our crumbling roads, bridges, and highways. We need to ensure our students receive an education that offers them the opportunities they deserve and ensures our nation has a skilled workforce for the 21st century. And we need to fight to maintain our edge in research and innovation because the next Apple or Microsoft or Google should be started right here in the United States. These are the kinds of investments that make us stronger. And as any business person will tell you, when you have a budget problem, the last areas you want to cut are those that will help you grow. Slashing R&D or capital investments may allow a business to look like they're lean and efficient in the short term, but only by undermining their competitive advantages over the long run. The same is true for the federal government. Both parties used to understand this. Strong federal investments played a key role in the broad-based economic growth that carried millions of families into the middle class in the 20th century. The Simpson-Bowles Commission report stated that one of its guiding principles and values was to invest in education, infrastructure, and high-value research and development to help our economy grow, to keep us globally competitive, and to make it easier for businesses to create jobs. But that bipartisan consensus seems to have eroded. Recently, more and more lawmakers here in Washington, D.C. have focused on shrinking short-term numbers regardless of the impact on jobs and economic growth. This has led to attempts, too often successful, to choke off the investments today that could make all the difference down the line. The fact is, if we slash our investments in infrastructure like roads and bridges, we aren't really saving money at all. We're making things worse. We are weakening our basis for private investment and economic growth we're putting public safety at risk, and congestion is taxing families' time with painfully long commutes and health-threatening pollution. Roads are going to need to be fixed eventually. Bridges will need to be strengthened at some point before they collapse, and waiting will only make the work more expensive when we eventually do it. And what will happen in the meantime? When a bridge deteriorates, at some point it is no longer safe for heavier traffic, such as emergency vehicles or large trucks. When roads fill with potholes, it makes traffic worse and driving more dangerous. So our families are less safe, our businesses can't move their goods quickly, and all just to save money in the short term. It's short-sighted and doesn't make sense. The American Society of Civil Engineers released a report card for America's infrastructure back in 2009. Our country got a D. More than 70,000 of our bridges across the country have been deemed structurally deficient. We're not keeping up with the repairs and have not for years, much less accounting for the growth of our, count our country's population. This is an area where you see agreement from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, major labor groups like AFL-CO, and economists and policy experts across the political spectrum. Investing in infrastructure creates jobs today, makes our families safer, and lays down a strong foundation for long-term growth. We're going to be hearing more about transportation infrastructure investments from one of our witnesses, the Undersecretary for Policy at the U.S. Department of Transportation, Polly Trottenberg. But this is a clear case where investments, investment cuts make our short-term budget deficit look better on paper, but cost us more in the long run and make other deficits worse, in this case, our infrastructure deficit. But it's not the only one. When we slash investments in our schools, Pell Grants, or worker training programs, we increase our skills and education deficit. 
This isn't good for our students and workers, and it's devastating for our economy over the long run. Investments in education from early childhood programs through college are some of the smartest the federal government can make. According to a study done at the University of Chicago by Nobel Prize winner Dr. James Heckman, high quality early childhood education programs have a 7 to 10 percent rate of return th uh, through better educational outcomes. We also know those with a high school diploma or less are more likely to be unemployed, to be among the long term unemployed and to earn substantially less than their counterparts. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, workers with a college degree can expect to make about a million dollars more over the course of their career than those with a high school diploma. But this isn't just a problem for the people and families directly affected, it is a challenge for our nation. If our workers do not have the skills they need to fill the jobs of today and tomorrow, our economy and our businesses pay the price too. Among our nation's manufacturers, 82% report a moderate to serious skills gap in their skilled positions. 74% say that this skills gap has negatively impacted their business and 70% expect it to get worse. McKinsey Global Institute estimates that the U.S. will need to produce roughly a million more post-secondary degrees by 2020, 40% more than today, to ensure we have the skilled workers our economy needs. One of the witnesses we hear from today, Tony, Tony Carnavali, the director of the Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, has estimated that by 2018, nearly two-thirds of U.S. jobs will require some education or training beyond a high school diploma. We know these investments pay off. In my home state of Washington, for example, a study found that the return on investment is seven to one for the resources put into serving dislocated workers, 13 to one for the post-secondary professional and technical education offered through the Perkins Act, 87 to 1 on Perkins funding at the secondary school level, and an astounding 91 to 1 on apprenticeship programs. We simply can't expect our economy to grow in a way that creates broad-based prosperity if we continue allowing our skills and education deficit to increase. If our businesses are going to be creating 21st century jobs, we need our students and workers to have 21st century skills. Today we will also be hearing more about the role of federal investments in research and innovation from Hunter Rollins, the president of the Association of American Universities. These investments have led to private sector growth in areas from pharmaceuticals to the internet to GPS and much more. They've led to new industries, new drugs, new inventions, and new jobs. They've led to private sector growth in areas such as pharmaceuticals, the internet, communication technology, products that keep our troops safe, the development of alternative energy sources, and improved energy efficiencies, and much more. They've led to new industries, new drugs, new inventions. They've provided jobs. They have expanded our economy. Today, 40% of US GDP, $6 trillion, comes from companies that did not exist 30 years ago. Innovation is beneficial for the economy overall, but also for families. A recent review by the Hamilton Project described how innovation improves life expectancy, makes technology affordable, and improves standards of living. The United States has been a leader in this area for decades, and we cannot afford for countries that understand the value of these long-term investments to overtake us. Cutting these investments off would help our budget deficit in the short term, but only at the expense of long-term increases in our research and innovation deficits, and that does not make sense. Although the role of federal investments is an important issue for us to address in the context of the pro-growth budget resolution we are currently working to write, this conversation is especially appropriate as we head toward the March 1st sequestration deadline. I remain hopeful that we can find a balanced and bipartisan replacement to sequestration in the next few days. But if we can't, investments in people, communities, and innovation would be hit hard. According to the White House, Title I education funding would be eliminated for more than 2,700 schools, cutting support for nearly 1.2 million students and putting thousands of teachers' jobs at risk. Head Start would be eliminated for approximately 70 thousand students and over 7,000 special education staff 
would lose their jobs. The National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation would have to delay or end scientific projects and make hundreds fewer research awards, which would mean an estimated 200,000 fewer jobs across America. And the FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research would face cutbacks, which would cause delays on new drug approval. This, of course, would come alongside the hundreds of thousands of jo jobs lost, major cuts to defense and non-defense programs, and the economic impact that could be devastating to our fragile economy. Even for people who think that investments need to be cut, sequestration is an awful and short-sighted way to do it. And I hope Republicans join us soon and work with us to replace it with a balanced mix of responsible spending cuts and new revenue from those who can afford it mo most. Now, I already mentioned three of our witnesses that, that were invited by the majority, and Senator Sessions will introduce the witnesses he has invited. But I want to thank David Malpass and Stephen Ferguson uh, as well for taking the time to be here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing more from all of our witnesses about the role of federal investments and the impact of automatic cuts. This is going to be an important issue for us as we work on our budget resolution here in the Senate. We absolutely need to tackle our debt and deficit. We need to cut spending responsibly. And of course, for government investments to truly pay off, we need private industry to succeed and innovate and create jobs. I believe smart federal investments will create jobs and help the middle class right now. They will help lay down a strong foundation for long-term and broad-based economic growth. And they help, will help position our country and our economy to compete and win in the 21st century global economy. Recent Republican budgets have moved away from these critical national investments, but I am really hopeful that the bipartisan work can continue to make sure we leave our children a stronger country than the one we received. And I'm looking forward to engaging the American public in this debate that is so central to their economic future. And with that, I will turn it over to Senator Sessions for his opening statement. 